Okay, on the Hale podcast this afternoon, all the way from the United Kingdom, we've got Hattie Taylor. Now, Hattie is a rower. She's represented Great Britain at various levels for the last four or five years and was in uh, line to go to the Olympics in a couple of months, but that's been put on uh, delay for 12 months. Um, she's got a great story in rowing and also has a little bit of a Hale connection as well. So, Hattie, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. No, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Also joining us, so we've got Mitch Obst, who's a boarder from Minanute um, and the Cox of our first eight, and Harry Morse, who's in our first eight, all the way from Scarborough, which isn't that far away, Hattie, to be honest. Um, uh, and now what I'm going to do is throw over to Harry um, to start asking you some questions, and we'll go from there. All right, so before you represented your country, do you remember how your rowing journey started and how you got into rowing? Yeah, um, so much like you, well, I assume you, I'm not sure if you started at Hale, but I also started at school. Um, I think it was my first year at school, so 2005, we had a Easter training camp. You weren't allowed to start rowing until Easter. So we had like a taster session or whatever, and there's probably like 70 girls or something, 70 12 year old girls whose parents were trying to find something for them to do in the Easter holidays. So we all had a bit of a, um, had this week long taster camp and my parents had done a little bit of rowing at university. So I think they were quite keen for me to give it a go. Um, so I basically started then and I never stopped. And here I am now. Yeah. Um, did you play any other sports at school? And did you always know that you wanted to be a rower or was there another sport that you always wanted to do? <laughs> Honestly, no, not really. I wasn't, I wasn't that. I found it a bit weird to say this, but I wasn't actually that sporty. Like I never did. So the main, the main sports in my school were netball and hockey. And I just never really, I was just not very good at hockey and just not very, my hand-eye coordination was way off the netball. So I just like didn't really thrive in either of those sports. So when, um, when rowing came around, I was like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm tall. And I feel like that's, you know, I, general requirement it, it helps so I was tall and I was relatively strong so I so I um was like all right at that so I stuck with it um but I didn't really know that I wanted to be a rower probably until honestly probably until university like I I um studied in the states so I got a rowing scholarship there which obviously is was great and like and quite intense and the training program was awesome the coaches and, and everything was great there um but probably my first year and a half I just I just wasn't really I was just there just just to live the university US university experience and um and just have fun with it and then sort of halfway through my second year I was like oh actually um my erg's going quite well, my water stuff's going quite well, everything else seems to be like ticking along nicely. So maybe this is something I could um, have a go at. And then, yeah, just, just kept training and did some under 23 stuff. And then when I graduated in 2017, decided that going to the senior team was something that I really wanted to try. And so I did, and here I am. Yeah. So from leaving school, so you, as you said, you went to America, but you also took a gap year training at Melbourne Uni and the boat club there. What was the training like compared to in Australia versus America and then back at home? Um, so the tra training at Melbourne Uni was great. It was honestly the best, like best six months of my life, best decision I ever made to go to Melbourne. Like I, it's just a great city. So I loved it. Um, and I think the main difference probably the main difference for me was the people at Melbourne Uni were also um balancing like studying and some had jobs and some were working so I think it was a lot more independent like obviously sessions and stuff were structured and um like there were coaches and stuff like doing the training program but a lot of stuff was like a like quite early in the morning so people could fit their studying and jobs around the training and then people would often come back later for for their second session but kind of like do it whenever but I'd just come out of school rowing and obviously that's you you're at school so you do it when the school day fits around you and you you do it pretty much I've been doing it all the same time for like five years so I think it was a lot more independent 
Um, and I also got to Melbourne in January, so it was really warm and much warmer than it was at home because I just left Melbourne's Christmas time. Cold. Huh? Melbourne's the cold place. I know, it was cold, but it was hot for me. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, probably those two. Probably being a, a bit more independent at Melbourne and uh, the weather. Yeah. Go, go, Mick. Can you tell us what rowing means to you and um, what keeps you coming back to it? Like, what's, what about rowing do you like so much? Um, this is a good question, actually, because we're, we've been talking about this a lot in the, like, during lockdown and, and, like, whilst we've been trying to keep our motivation up and spirits high and stuff, we've been talking about why it is that we keep coming back to rowing. Um, and I think, for me, it's probably, like, I want to go to the Olympics and I want to reach, like, the pinnacle of my sport. And I also feel like I haven't, I'm, I'm still improving, like, my numbers and the erg and stuff and and my water performances are still improving. So I feel like I haven't reached the peak yet. And I just want to keep going to see, you know, just just see how far I can keep doing that and how long I can keep doing that. Um, so I think that's what brings me back. And also I love being part of a team and I love training. And I've, I think I've trained for so long now. I just don't really know any other way of life. Like I, I basically, like if I weren't to be training, I honestly don't know what I'd be doing. Um, but that's something that I don't have to think about yet, so it's fine. Yeah. But I think, sorry. You go, I was just going to the next question. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I just think, I just think um, it's, yeah, probably just um, the improvements that my, I just keep, keep getting better and I love being part of the team. So that's what drives me on. So in 2015, you were picked to represent Great Britain in the under 23 women's eight at the World Cup. We, and then you also came third in 2018 in the pair. What was the process of training and getting through all that, as well as standing on the podium and representing your nation? What was that all like? Um, so, so 2015 was my first GB uh, like international race that I'd done. So that was um, at the under 23s. So I was in the, it was all a bit of a whirlwind because I'd, I'd come back for the summer and then I'd, done seat race like quite an intense block of seat racing and then you obviously train for the summer and um and then you race and, and then we got medals so that was great but and it was my first it was my first race so I was like oh great this is so fun and I, like I didn't really know what was going on it was all a bit of a whirlwind so that was really cool um but then in 2018 that was my sort of second season or sort of first second season on the on the senior team and that was I think that one meant a lot more because it was my first no not my first international race but it was my first senior international race in in that boat and um, I was actually rowing racing with my housemate who I still live with so it was like a, like this little project that we had going and we were just sort of doing our own thing and um yeah it was just it was great it was like like stepping on the podium is something that when you, you get to this level doesn't happen that much so when it does happen you're like oh cool like wow i love doing this but then you realize how hard it is to to keep doing that um like when you're at school and or or at university you 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 win and like it's i guess it's easier to win but then you get here and you, it, it just r really rarely happens so when it does happen you're like this is awesome like i want to do this all the time and it, it spurs you on actually it, it's a really good motivator of course, for for training hard and wanting to be there again. Yeah. So you said you haven't quite reached your peak yet, but the post Corona at your peak training time, what does your training look like then? And how did you manage, I assume like study and like a, some sort of a job? how did you manage all those? Um, so we are actually, so I graduated in 2017 and I, I came back to join this, the team in, well, just in the summer of 2017. So I, I finished my studies and also we're, we're lucky enough to be funded by the national lottery. So we don't actually have to work, which is really, really good because of, there's just no time, like the amount of training that there is and, and the recovery that you need, there's no time to be, to be working. Saying that some people do some you know, like online stuff or low level, like tutoring and things like that. But I really, it's, I think it's more beneficial that if you don't, if you're fortunate enough to be in a position that you don't have to work. Um, but the training program would be, I mean, it's pretty much, 
it, it changes a bit like we do more ergs in the winter and then we're on the water more in the summer um but like when when racing is approaching but it's pretty much three sessions a day half days wednesdays and saturdays and most sundays off but sometimes we'll have one row on a sunday so it's pretty much it's, it's pretty much all the time um but we're done by like 4 p.m or something we have to get up a bit earlier but then we're done and then it's fine and yeah still pretty full on mm. it's full on but you get used to it do you have a particular event in your rowing career that sticks out and why? Um, well, apart from the, the pairs race in 2018 that I, that I just spoke about, which was great because that was just like with my best friend and we'd done a lot of work for that. Um, probably last summer at the Olympic qualifiers, we qualified the women's eight for Tokyo 2020, which was pretty cool. And that was after a summer of quite like, um there had been a few ups and downs and a few i don't want to say disagreements but like we had a bit we had a bit of a like a bit of a fallout but we came back by the time of racing so it was a bit of a stressful summer um so i think to to sort of like put that behind us when racing came and sort of do the job was was a success in our eyes yeah what would one piece of advice be to any young aspiring athlete that wants to represent their country or their state or do something in high level sport? God, I have so much advice. Um, how long have we got? No. Um, I think, I think um, the most important one would be to, like, I, I feel like when you look at a lot of successful athlete, athletes and you don't, you don't really like know their story as much you just see like success after success after success and this is probably with any athlete not just rowers and you just see you just see like the highlight reel and just see like when they've done well but you never see people never talk about when they've been injured or when they've not been selected for something and had to have have to like come back after being sent back to their club from like the national training center and like things like that you never really know about that and unless you're in, inside it so I think just knowing that people, like every everyone has ups and downs, honestly, literally everyone, even like Olympic champions that are in the team now that I know have had ups and downs, like even in Olympic year, nothing ever goes to plan. Like it's never quite smooth. Um, so I think just like probably coming back from, from those setbacks well and knowing that just because you might be having a little down bit so probably as everyone else they just haven't told you about it and you just it, it's just coming back from it and you will come back from it like I've had a bunch of ups and downs and you just have to basically just not stop um and until you get back yeah. also have fun because you don't want to do it if you're not having fun so with this coronavirus you've obviously been kept off the water and out of training as a team what are some of the ways you've been keeping both fit and with your training? And also, like, what does your training program look like now compared to six months ago? So, as I was saying, we had like three sessions a day. Um, it's dropped. So, what we've been in this lockdown for about for a month now, I think a month yesterday. And um, the training, pro so we're still being sent a training program by a head coach, um, which is basically two sessions a day. So, some sort of it's like typically an erg and weights um but it, it they're being a little bit more flexible with it so we can run if we want or we can um cycle if we want which has been quite good because i quite like um being on my bike and and i get to do that a bit more because we don't really there's not much scope for it like if we weren't in lockdown um and motivation wise we've been having quite a lot of meetings so we have zoom calls with like our our crew and our team twice a week so that's been keeping spirits up and and it's been quite good because people have been quite honest about how they feel like it's not like oh yeah I'm smashing through the training I'm I'm doing pbs every week like not everyone's everyone you know like I said people have ups and downs so people are like honestly I'm not feeling I'm not feeling great I didn't do this session I didn't do that session um which actually helps if if like you're not feeling that good yourself because then you're like oh okay someone else is feeling like me and they're not all just you know winning on every erg so 
I think that that keeps things sort of a bit more realistic and in perspective a little bit. What does an erg set look like for you guys sort of in quarantine? Like what is the... Um, what, so like what sort of training? What sort of, what's your sort of standard pace set? Um, well, it depends what we're doing. So if we're doing, uh, say, like a long steady erg, it would be like a sort of low two minute split for however long the erg is, if that's just like a steady UT2 erg. Yeah. Um, but then if we're doing pieces, like twice a week we'll have pieces. So we'll be doing anywhere from like a half hour rate 20 to two 2Ks and a 1K at sort of like closer to 2K pace. Yeah. So it really, it, it varies a lot, but like generally we'll be doing a lot of steady state stuff and then we'll throw in the pieces to keep up that, um, that like high level intensity stuff. Yeah. How has Olympics being moved back here affecting your terms of like motivation and training? Like, does it be, does it, it being set back, does it make you want to train harder or what has that done to your team's motivation? Um, it was a bit mixed, honestly. I think, I think a lot of us, so a lot of the team right now are quite young and this is their first Olympics. This was going to be their first Olympics. Um, so I think, I think a bunch of us were probably a little bit disappointed because obviously, you, you know, you've, especially this year as well with Olympic selection was actually really, really stressful. Um, and I think to see light at the end of the tunnel was just like, obviously great for, for a lot of us. Um, and now we've had, so it was a bit disappointing, but it's also, it's, it's out of our hands, isn't it? It's not like the most important thing that's going on right now. So it was sort of as disappointing as it was, it was also, it was the, the right decision and the necessary decision. Um, but in terms of, of um, motivation for training, I think it's actually, it's, it, we're, make, we, we're having to make a lot of short-term goals because to go from, I think it was like a hundred or something days to like 500 days time was, was a bit of a jump. And that was like, Oh, okay. I can't, there's no light at the end of the tunnel anymore. So it, it, I think we're like just as motivated to train. It's just staying disciplined in this time with, with how we do it. And, um, and like making sure we just get everything done. But I think also, like I said, the team's quite young. So I actually think another year, would probably be quite beneficial and i think next year we'll we might even be well not glad because of corona but like glad that we had the extra time to train um and and just get a bit more done but it's just it's sort of an opportunity to get stronger and fitter so can i pop in now with a question sorry to interrupt are you olympic selections confirmed for you or is there another trial you need to go through where things could change given there's a year's delay so um so a month ago <laughs> we got selected on the saturday we got sent home on the saturday lockdown government lockdown was announced on the monday and then we got deselected on the tuesday so it was all a bit of a like whirlwind four days um so yeah we're basically we i'm not sure the coaches know exactly or i'm sure they do but we don't know yet exactly how next year is going to look but there there is going to be reselection so it's not like, oh, we got selected this year, you're fine for next year. Like, we're pretty much going to have to go through it again, which is a little daunting, but... That, that would be the same in most sports, most countries, though. Wouldn't I it? imagine so, yeah. Yeah. But I think it would be a bit comfortable if they've got... If they know they're going to the Olympics a year and a half out. Exactly. You, you just get complacent, wouldn't you? And I just don't think that is... Yeah. Like, as much as I, you know, would love not to do selection again, it's, it is very necessary. Sorry, so we've talked about all the highlights of your rowing career. I can imagine there were hurdles along the way, sort of physical selection and mental. Do you remember a particular period of your career where things were not going too well and how you managed to fight through and what advice you'd give their boys who are having their own battles? Oh, yeah. Um, so the first one that springs to mind is 2017. So I just, that's when I graduated and came home and joined the team. And I basically got home. There was seat racing almost straight away. Um, for the world championships that year which were in Florida 
and I didn't make it. so because I'd come home a bit later than everyone else um like a lot of sections some sections had been done but there were be, I think it was seat racing left for for uh, the pair and the four um and there were still like a bunch of like maybe what's that six places so there were probably like eight of us or something actually no I think there were se- nine of us racing so there were spaces for a pair and a four two spares and then there'd be one left over and basically I ended up being the one left over so I wasn't even a spare so I was left at home where the whole team went on training camp for like six weeks and then they went to race for I think they were there for 10 days maybe um so I was at home by myself training in a single for like two months which was just I was honestly miserable like I didn't want to like I didn't want to row I I was like what I've just graduated I've just I've come back I'm rowing by myself well there were a little group of us rowing but I was just just not where I wanted to be um and then I think probably halfway through that time I was just like actually nah like I'm not going to be left at home I'm, I'm better than what I did I was just the seat racing didn't go well for me and I wasn't I wasn't rowing well and I wasn't moving the boat very well, but I'm going to learn how to move the boat well. And when the next trial comes, I'm going to do better. And then I basically just, like I didn't win the next trials, but I just sort of made sure each trial uh, that we had, I just, I would just go like one up, just get one place better. And I was like, I don't need to beat everyone. I just need to beat one person and then another person, another person. So I basically commit, I was, I was like committing myself to, to just, just like chip away a little bit every day um and then I got and then it and then it worked out but like I had to put in I had to work quite hard for for a good seven months before it it started working out for me um so I think just in terms of advice like that that might happen to you and I've seen like I've I've had to chip away and I've, I've come back and I've seen other athletes being injured for six months and pretty much look like boats are set for worlds or for the olympics and then and then they'll come back and then they'll get selected for the boat because they've just chipped away and just like done what they can do and like done their rehab and done their training well and just basically been determined enough to to work hard to to get back so yeah that's sort of the first the, the big one that i've had the big like upset almost uh, so how we talk a fair bit about what it takes to be a team player. Do you remember a teammate, past or present, that has been a special to you and what made them that person? Oh, good question. Um, well, all my teammates are great, of course. But I think... I think the most... Um, the most like helpful and probably influential teammates I've had are the ones that aren't um, aren't just in it for themselves, which is literally like basically what being a team player is, isn't it? Which, which sounds simple, but um, I think like when I was saying about um, in 2017 when I was just learning to to make pair like move pairs and and make the boat go a bit faster, I think the the girls who and I won't name names, but I have a couple of names in my head. Um, the girls who were really patient with me and and weren't just like put in a boat with me and it wasn't going fast and just gave up. Like those people were just honestly not helpful. And I I sort of understand why they um, why they were like that because they they have to they want to do well. Like their names on the line as well. But the girls who actually took the time to to like help me and like help other people as well. I think were probably the the best some of the best teammates I've ever had yeah. like not just looking out for themselves like well, willing to help others as well yeah do you have a pre-race ritual or just something little that you do before every race you do um I actually don't really like I know a lot of people do but I I I actually I always listen to music I don't know if that if that's really a ritual I think everyone does that um what else do I do I have to do exactly the same warm up on the erg. Like if we're doing a bit of an erg warm up before we get on the water to do the warm up, I'll do like exactly the same thing like to the to the second. So that's that's probably a bit of a ritual. Um, what else? 
No, that's probably it, actually. I'll pop in here with one more question. I was just thinking yeah. when you're talking about the, the, that you're a contracted athlete for one of a better phrase and selections yeah. like that must be some of the hardest selections, the athletes that just miss out on that financial support and hence have to get a job. That's almost a hurdle too much to overcome when you can, those yeah. that can dedicate, you know, I mean, every, every hour of the day to get it better and those that don't get supported have to go and work and have to do it outside. Like that must be the most cutthroat time. Yeah. For connections and support. Yeah, it is. I think, um, I think, the, the girls so there's girls at other clubs who are very fast and, and come to trials and stuff and are, are like very competitive but I just think they are probably a little on the back foot because they don't can't access the support like the financial support that we can so that that you know they have to spend a few hours every day on their feet doing work or something or whatever um but I think so for example some there's a couple of people over the years who have been sent back to their club from the training center um, because of like poor performances or something. And I think their funding, I think they, pro I think they get a couple of months It's in the contract that you get a couple of months once you're, you're not fired, but you know, you're sent back. Yeah. Um, but that actually probably is, I can imagine a very stressful time because you have two months or something when you're being paid still. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you're just not being paid anymore. And then, you're trying to get a job and row and get back into the team, but you can't because you have to be on your feet working. And yeah. so, yeah, we are very lucky to be supported by the national lottery, but yeah. I imagine it's quite hard for people who aren't. Yeah. Harry, last couple of questions for your. Uh, what is your PB 2K? <laughs> Am I allowed to tell you that? I don't know. <laughs> um, I, at Christmas, I pulled a 6.45 but I didn't do, so we have one at Christmas and one at, in March time. And March time is where everyone PBs, but I had a sore rib in in March. So I didn't do it, so I'm a bit annoyed, but I currently it's 6.45, yeah. And so every Tuesday is pie day here at Hale and all the boarders and staff get pies for lunch. The boarders do not know how to eat a pie properly. Their favorite way is to take the roof off put the sauce and then eat it out with a fork and then just eat the pastry. How do you eat a meat pie? <laughs> I don't know. I like this question when I saw it because it actually made me think about how to eat a pie. Um, so are we thinking about like, cause I, I feel like pies might be different. So pies here are like, um, like a bowl shape with like a, like short, short cross pastry. Yeah, is that I think called? some of the English pies don't have pastry at the bottom. Like the Australian pies, you pretty much put in your hand and, yeah. Um, but the English pie's got the mushy peas and the, you know, well, you peas. have loads of stuff like whatever in them, but they're they quite got quite thick pastry on top. But so this is so I'm thinking of an English pie when I when I um, answered this question or thought about this question and how I would eat it actually is kind of similar to how you just said it shouldn't be eaten. <laughs> so I think I would I think I would cut it in half, get all the insides out. So I'm like a child playing with my food, aren't I? And then eat the insides, eat the bottom bit of the pastry and then eat the like lid um, pastry bit by itself just because I love pastry. So I'd leave the best bit to last. I think that's what I would do. I don't know what the right way is. So what's the best way to do it? That way. All done two hands uh, and that's two all right. That's right. Next time you're in, uh, over in Perth here, we'll have to uh, we'll have, take you out and show you how to eat yeah, a pie. Yeah, well, you can teach me. So, all right. Now, Hattie, thanks so much for giving up a little bit of time. Um, hopefully, um, you stay safe and healthy over there, and we can see you back on the water and at the Olympics next year. And well, one thing we didn't mention here is your um, cousin, Matt Scholfort, um, is in year 12, and that's a connection here. So, is, and, and George, who's in year nine, actually, I teach him. So, um, oh. there is a connection here to, here to Hale. Um, so, I think uh, after this, there'll be a lot of Hale boys beyond those two that will be uh, really cheering for you uh, next year at Tokyo. So thank you very much for giving up your time. That's okay. Thank you. thank you for having me. It was great.